today we're going to uh, be talking about Noah's Ark, kind of everything you wanted to know about Noah's Ark, but we're afraid to ask, I guess. Most, most people in the world, most people certainly don't uh, believe the literal interpretation of the Bible when it comes to Noah's Ark. They uh, feel that Noah was a legendary figure, probably didn't really exist. It's a good children's story. Uh, the Ark, oops, the Ark, you know, you've see, all seen these uh, paintings or these uh, depictions. A children's story, Ark with the animals, all of them with their, you know, typical with their, the giraffes are always there. <laughs> and it's not to be really taken seriously. Well, there are other writers of the Bible, though. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Peter, Paul, who refer to the ark. They refer to the flood. And uh, these are the uh, various different, uh, and we won't turn to them, but these are the various different places where the ark is discussed in the Old Testament here. Noah, of course, is included in genealogy in First Chronicles. He's also included in the genealogy of the book of Luke. And uh, uh, in the New Testament, the ark, ark and Noah and the flood are discussed in Peter, in both First and Second Peter, and Paul, who wrote Hebrews. So uh, it is present in, in the Bible, and... Jesus Christ himself talked about Noah's Ark, Matthew 24, 37, and 39. But as the days of Noah were, and I think we covered this last time, but as the days of Noah were, he referred to him as a person. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be, and of course that's uh, that as we talked about last time in the antediluvian period where there was uh, uh, sin, uh, that that uh, almost continual sin will come back prior to the time of the second coming of Christ. For as in the days that were before the flood, he talks about the flood there, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. He talks about the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So he, he, Jesus talks about this as, a, as something that literally, actually uh, happened as a historical event. If you look at Genesis 6, chapter 11, verse, the earth also was corrupt before God, and of course we talked about this in detail last time, and the earth was filled with violence, and God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. This word corrupt uh, means actually to, uh, it means that it was decayed, it was, uh, it was ruined, in other words. The reason for the destruction uh, that took place was, of course, the universal universal human wickedness that was, a, was present on this earth at that particular time and the depravity that occurred from, from man. Man had turned completely to his own ways and in, in so doing he destroyed, him, he destroyed himself. And uh, uh, Noah's family lived in the midst of this, uh, of this depravity uh, but they weren't, they weren't corrupted. Uh, Satan had corrupted the whole world, and of course, as we've talked about here before, he's trying to block the line to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and he's doing that by trying to corrupt everything he possibly can with uh, corrupt man as much as he possibly can. So there was um, moral and spiritual corruption on this, uh, on this earth, but Satan couldn't succeed in corrupting just the one family, Noah, uh, uh, who Satan had to corrupt to block the the line from from Adam to to uh, the seed of the woman, who of course is Jesus. Now, 
If you look at verse 12 there, it says, and God was looking, and God looked upon the earth. So he was looking on the earth, although the earth was going totally away from God, God uh, still was looking on the earth. And as it says in Hebrews uh, 4.13 there, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. There's nothing that he doesn't see, in other words. But all things are marked and open unto the eyes of him. He sees everything uh, with whom we have to do. So God, God is omniscient. He's totally omniscient. He realizes what's going on in everyone's life, in your life, in my life, all the time. Uh, he's totally aware of everything that occurs. And you look at Genesis, uh, the next uh, verse there, in chapter 6, verse 13, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. The earth itself would be destroyed, as it says there, I will destroy them with the earth. In other words, not only all humans are going are to be destroyed here, but the entire earth is going to be destroyed. And we're going to look at that in detail next, next week. Uh, he, so he's going to destroy man with the earth. And, and it doesn't say that he is going to destroy it, man from the earth, but the earth will be. And as it says in 2 Peter uh, 3, 6, by which the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. And the key word there is perished. And that's why, as I said here before, don't waste your time looking for the Garden of Eden. It is totally, totally gone. Uh, the the uh, entire earth, the continents, uh, the con the, probably one continent prior to the time of the flood, uh, was totally destroyed and what we have left is completely different than it was prior to that time. Now, so if you <clears throat> look at Genesis 6, 14 through 16, I've included all those verses here. This is, this is the directions that God gives to Noah to build this ark. Got to have... If, if you're not on the ark and you live in the, on the land, you're going to die. That's, that's the bottom line. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shall thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shall thou uh, make to the ark, and in a cubit shall thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shall thou set in the side thereof with lower, second, and third stories shall thou make it. So he gives some details here of how to, how to put this uh, ark together. The ark was made to preserve humans and animals, those animals and man, of course, who's, who are living on, on, the, on the earth. They're on the, they're as if you go back to creation, they're on the lithosphere. The biblical dimensions of the ark are, are a lot larger than anyone thinks. This here is a person standing right here and this is a uh, this is in the Netherlands, and uh, this is an ark that's built to the to the biblical dimensions. There, there's one being built in Kentucky right now at the Creation Museum. The uh, uh, it was uh, the ark did not look like a typical boat. I'm sure I'm not even sure this is really true. They've got rounded edges here. There's nothing. There's nothing that says that there was rounded edges on the on the ark. I I picture it more like a barge than than a uh, than a boat. This looks a little bit too much like a boat to me. But uh, uh, 
it it was the reason it was built like a, a like a barge was because it, it it had a flat bottom. It was designed for capacity. In other words, you wanted to get as much in there as you possibly could. And, uh, and also it was designed fl for floating stability, so it would be very stable on a, on a rough sea. And it will, remember, it was just really there for floating. It didn't have to go anywhere. It didn't have to move in any particular direction. There's a quotation from Mendez here who have, has looked into this and, he, and his quotation is the ark was built on a one to six ratio. If you remember it said it was 300 cubits long, it was 50 cubits wide. Uh, a one to six ratio, it's a, the science of naval architecture reveals that the most stable ratio for an ocean going vessel is one to six. Isn't that interesting? All modern day ocean going vessels use the same length to width ratio. It is estimated that the ark could easily have survived even the largest of ocean waves. These dimensions are very stable, in other words, for, for, for tipping. Uh, there <coughs> would be even more stable when, when the ark is at capacity, in other words, when it's, when it's loaded. It's almost impossible to capsize. As a matter of fact, they say that you can tilt, tilt the tilt the uh, arc at almost 90 degrees and it still will not capsize. So the, uh, uh, it's, a very, it's very stable because the, uh, once the earth is completely covered by water, we're going to go into this in detail next time, but when uh, it's completely covered by water, the waves are going to be of tremendous size. Uh, the, I, the Dimensions are similar to the large ships that are present today, including the, the, the uh, super tankers. It's a lot larger than most people think. 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits. A cubit the size, uh, there, there are, if you look into this on, and try to determine how long a cubit is, you get all kinds of different numbers. Hebrew cubits, uh, which could be the cubit they're talking about here, is, are 17 and a half inches or 20.4 20 20 inches. There's a Babylonian cubit, though, and there's other ones. So most of these numbers hit right around 18 inches. It's the length, it's actually the length of from your elbow to, your, to the tip of your finger. That's, that's what a cubit is. So if, if, but how big was Noah? So... You know, that's going to vary a little bit inch to inch if we have everybody here measure their, the length of their el bent elbow to the tips of their fingers. We'd have different numbers also. But if you take 18 inches, you end up with, a, with, with about 450 feet to, by 75 feet by 45 feet. It's huge. The, uh, uh, interestingly enough, this, this uh, church right here, the, this room, uh, is about 75 feet wide. And uh, the height of the, of the peak here, uh, Gene tells me, is 48 feet. So it's very close. Uh, uh, so this, this area, of course, the, we have a slanted roof here, and the roof would be flat. And uh, then it would be divided up into three stories, uh, those stories being each 15 feet high. So it uh, gives you an idea of the size and the end of this. The entire building, though, would have to be about 150 feet longer than it is. So it gives you an idea of the size of this, uh, of this vessel. It's, it's, it's huge. It wasn't until the 1800s that another ship was built that had the capacity that the Ark did. So... Its capacity and its floor area, remember it has three decks, as I just mentioned, and the floor area is 101, 101 just over 100,000 square feet of space. So there's a, there's a tremendous amount of space in, in this. <coughs> I've dealt with animal facilities all my life. I mean, that's what my job was. And I can tell you that... Uh, 100,000 square foot animal facility is a very, very large animal facility. Um, 
and usually they're divided. Uh, it, to get that number of square feet, you have to be in more than one building or be on more than one floor of, a, of buildings. The cubic foot capacity is what, one, about one and a half million cubic feet of space. That calculates to 569 standard railroad, railway boxcars. Uh, if you're going to calculate the number of uh, <clears throat> animals that will fit in there, the USDA number for how many sheep can fit on a boxcar is 240. You calculate this out, you get 136,000 roughly. You know, I'm not, these numbers aren't exactly right, but 136,000 sheep-sized animals. So that's a lot. That's a lot of animals. And I'm going to get into how many you need on the ark here in a second. But <clears throat> this, one of the things to bring out here is the size of this ark alone uh, just shows you that uh, this wasn't any local flood. I mean, this wasn't some local flood that occurred in the Mesopotamian Valley. Uh, this is a worldwide flood. Uh, if, if, it was, if it was local, why would you have to put all the animals on it? It makes no sense. The animals would just go somewhere else. And, uh, and if they were more evenly distributed, a lot of them wouldn't even have to come to the ark uh, because they could survive outside if it was local. So this, <clears throat> there's no way this is a local flood. So if, that's, if you're thinking that, Forget it. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense. And uh, next week when I go into the details of what occurs at, actually at the time of the flood, uh, there's no way this is, uh, no way this is local. This is a worldwide flood. Now going back to uh, those uh, verses of, that, uh, that God gave Noah to how to build this thing, the, uh, <clears throat> this thing, as I said, it was uh, divided into rooms. So there's, there's rooms within and on all of these, uh, all of these uh, floors. And each room, of course, would be 15 feet high. Now, how much division was even within those rooms we don't uh, we don't know but there could be in some cases depending on the size of the animals that go in there uh, I can tell you that again from from the 40 years I spent uh, in laboratory animal medicine uh, we can we can put uh, thousands of mice in a room for instance just by by stacking them on on various different levels so, uh, and that could, be, could have easily been done here. So, in other words, you don't just have the floor space. You have even more than that when you start dividing things into rooms. And, of course, you divide them into rooms depending on the animals who, uh, of which species, which, what species uh, there, there are. So, that, that, uh, uh, it all makes, uh, it all kind of makes sense from a how to, how to house animal standpoint says that this ark was made out of gopher wood. I can tell you right now that no one knows what gopher wood is. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can read all you want about this, and there's all kinds of speculation. Uh, most, most of the speculators come down on uh, either cypress or cedar, but really, it's, it's, it's really not known what, uh, what type of wood this was. Uh, keep in mind that some of the trees that were present prior to the time of the flood are probably now extinct. So maybe it was a tree and it was a type of lumber that doesn't even exist today. So uh, you, we don't know, in other words. But it, uh, most people feel it was probably some kind of hardwood. And uh, honestly, there's really, you can read a lot on this, and I have over the years, and there's really no consensus of what type of wood this, uh, with, what this wood, wood is. Uh, the reason cypress and cedar are common is because that's what they, that's what they find in that, that, that area today. But keep in mind, everything was redone. So the, the wood isn't really known. It says that it would be pitched 
it within and without. That's both sides now. This is obviously to make uh, the, the, the uh, ark uh, totally, uh, totally watertight. And uh, the pitch it's a, is a resinous covering, which uh, we all know what wood pitch looks like. And uh, uh, that had to be done just so the thing would, wouldn't sink, obviously. And uh, it talks about a window. A window shall thou make to, to the ark. Actually, what this is is a one cubit opening, which is 18 inches, and it goes around the entire periphery of the ark on the, on the top. And uh, this is, was put in there uh, for ventilation and also for, uh, for light. Also, it talks about a door being on the side. There appear, apparently is only one way into this ark, and that's a door on the side. And, uh, <clears throat> and the building of this ark, when Noah is building it, uh, the people around there must have thought he was total, had totally lost it and was crazy because he's building this huge thing. And uh, <clears throat> there's uh, Genesis 2.5 says that God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. Now, I realize that there's a lot of people that feel that he hadn't caused it to rain up till that time and it may have rained, rained after that time prior to the flood. But if you, uh, if you look at it, at it from the standpoint uh, of a canopy theory that on the second day God produced a canopy of water vapor prior, uh, above us, that would prevent rain. So it may not have even rained at the time. The other, the other, uh, 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 the other evidence for that is when the, in Genesis 2.5, if you look that up, it's, it says that uh, God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and then it goes on in that verse to, to describe a totally different hydrological cycle than we have today. And that would even more so say that it may have never rained prior to the time uh, Noah started building this ark. So you can get an idea that the people that are there just are thinking, this guy's totally lost his mind. And in uh, the 17th verse of Genesis 6, it says, And behold, I, even I, and this, of course, is God speaking here, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. Notice that, breath of life. From under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. So, first off, God told Noah here what type of destruction is going to occur. This is going to be a flood of waters. And this is the most significant destruction that has occurred on this planet ever in history. It occurred about 4,500 years ago. And this is by far the most significant thing that has ever occurred to this planet. And as I'll describe next time, it actually breaks the planet apart and destroys it. And uh, the uh, uh, and this uh, wa this word here in the Hebrew for flood is mabul, which is a word uh, that means a muddy flood of water. It is only it's used uh, here, and it's uniquely used here. It's only used in the Bible eleven times in the Old Testament, of course. And every time it is used, it is used to describe this deluge that occurs during the time of Noah. It doesn't refer to it. In other words, when a, if, if there's other words that are used for flood in the Old Testament, but never this word. This word always refers to this flood. It is, in other words, this is no ordinary flood. This is... Uh, uh, Nothing that we can relate to today, even the floods that I, I think that we've seen just this last week, uh, are nothing like this flood. Uh, it has been referred to uh, by people who've, who have studied this as an actual explosion of water onto the surface. And uh, 
as I'll say next time, you know, the idea that it just starts raining and everybody's kind of hanging around wondering what's going on and all of a sudden you're in six inches of water and, and then you start to kind of wonder and then you're waist deep and you start to panic. No, that's not how it happened. Uh, most people probably died within seconds and probably certainly minutes after the time of this judgment. It was tremendous. This judgment, as, it sa- as God says, will destroy, uh, will destroy all flesh. And it talks about here, well, it will destroy all flesh, and it talks about wherein is the breath of life. Only those animals that had the breath of life, in other words, were going to be destroyed here. And that the breath of life refers to air-breathing animals that breathe through nostrils. That's what actually this means. So <clears throat> those uh, the humans, of course, breathe through nostrils, and we know many, many animals do, all the mammals do, and, and reptiles, amphibians, they all breathe through nostrils. But insects, for instance, don't breathe through nostrils. They breathe through, uh, through spiracles, which are on the exoskeleton of this in the insect, and these invertebrates, uh, a lot of there's the reason I bring this up is because a lot of people criticize this because they say, well, there's, there's, I've seen n- numbers of different species, and these numbers are all over the place. You'd think you'd know how many species are present on Earth today. Forget it. <laughs> there's so many different opinions, and uh, uh, some people say 800,000 species of uh, insects and arthropods. Other people say it's, uh, it's uh, well over a million. I don't know how many there are, but I can tell you that they're breathing through spiracles, so they probably didn't have to be on the ark. How could they survive? Well, think about it. They're, 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 for one thing, there was tr- huge vegetation mats that were present on the surface that they probably could survive on. They all lay, they all lay eggs. The eggs can survive just like plant plants did through, through the seeds, well, these animals, uh, and many of them are so small, I mean, you can't see, you, you think about this, it includes all the mites and lice and all these other, you can't see these, these uh, most of these uh, uh, insects and arthropods, so uh, they could even be uh, surviving, let's face it, there's, there's a lot of them in this room right here, we don't know about them, but they're here. <laughs> And uh, they could be on the ark too. So there, there could be a lot of areas where these, uh, these many, many uh, species of animals that are quoted could, could survive. So, uh, it, and it says that it was primarily, well, why was the ark made? Well, to save those animals that had the breath of life. Uh, th- those aren't the animals that were supposed to be on the ark, even though they probably were. So this judgment, this judgment, though, shows that uh, God has complete power over his creation, complete power, and uh, that uh, he isn't going to put up with man having a totally immoral life, in other words. Uh, <clears throat> now, 6.18 says that, uh, but with thee I will establish my covenant, uh, of course, he's talking to Noah here. Thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy, and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. So God establishes a covenant with these, and eight people will be, uh, will be protected here uh, through this. In verses 19 and 20. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, uh, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee, they shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. Uh, Noah gets instructions from God. These are the instructions he gets to preserve all these animals. A pair of each kind, of course they're male and female, for reproduction after the ark. 
uh, to keep them alive, uh, to keep that line of species alive, in other words. Now, could all the animals fit on the ark? Well, the animals to be taken on were the land, as I said, the land animals, land vertebrate animals. Uh, it, it includes the domestic and wild animals, the flyers, the fowl, as it says, and we know from the creation on day, on, uh, day five that those are the flyers. It includes not only birds, but it includes other animals that flew too, including bats, for instance. But, uh, and then the creeping things, uh, the creeping things, the, the word that's used in the Hebrew really is the word for reptile. And uh, in other words, they didn't have to take any animal that sur could survive in the water. I remember a book that we got for the, our kids when they were little uh, was Noah's Ark book, and, and Noah was carrying fish bowls on. Well, you know, it's just... It's <laughs> No, you don't. You don't carry fish bowls on. You don't. You don't have to. They're in the water. They're going to survive. Uh, or uh, you don't have to carry plants on. You know. I mean, the plants are going to survive through the seeds that they have, and uh, they're going to. But on the other hand, we know that a lot of animals, uh, because of the changes that occurred, became extinct, and we. And there are plants that came, became extinct at this particular time also. I'm going to go into detail on that in the next weeks. So the number of species that were needed on the ark depends on who's determining what a sort is or what a kind is. And uh, because that's the two words that were used there. Uh, now many animal species, now these animals here would all be counted up as uh, four. They're all macaques and they're all in southeast uh, uh, all in Southeast Asia or in Asia, and they're uh, and they're they're all now there there are even more macaques than I put on here that are divided up into various different uh, genuses, but this guy here is a Philippine macaque, and this guy here is a pigtail. He's in Indonesia. This is a rhesus. He's on the continent of Asia, and here's a Japanese macaque. He's in Japan. Now, all these are separated geographically, and I can tell you that you can take any of these macaques, breed them together, and they have young. So it's really, in other words, what I'm trying to say is here, here there would be several species counted by biologists, but really there's probably one on the ark. There are, there's two, obviously. There's, there's just, you know, and whether it looked like a rhesus or it looked like a pigtail or whatever it looked like. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I can tell you that all these, all these uh, kinds here, all these, uh, gene, these different species interbreed. So really this is where you get into the difficulty of trying to determine how many numbers actually are on it. So we're on this side of the flood looking back and we're trying to determine this uh, question after there's been significant genetic variation since that time, in other words, and geographical isolation. The number of species varies a lot, in other words, and it varies anywhere from 8,000 uh, to, prob to probably around 18,000. And those are pretty, 18,000 is, a, is, is a probably a pretty conservative number, conservative being a large number in counting a lot of different uh, species. If you, uh, you, there's probably twice that many, uh, there's pro in other words, there's probably 36,000 species based on the number that became extinct. And uh, you got to double that number again for two sexes, male and female, of course there was a pair. And so the total number of animals that go on the ark is at the highest, probably about 75,000. Now the ark has a capacity, as I said before, 135,000 sheep-sized animals. So you can see just on a quick calculation in your head that uh, there's enough space on the ark for these animals. So what's the average size of these animals? I noticed uh, I said that they're sheep size. Well, 
animals, if you calculate all these species, they're significantly less in size. We think of big animals, but there's, there's so many rodents and lizards and everything else that uh, the size of these animals ends up, uh, uh, ends up being a lot less than that. Only 11% of land animals are larger than a sheep, for instance. And the average size is actually the size of a rabbit. It's, uh, as a matter of fact, a small rabbit. So, uh, in other words, all these animals uh, will be able to fit onto the ark. Also, uh, you're going to put on board, keep in mind, you're going to put young animals on board. Because when they get off, what are they going to do? Well, they're given the instructions by God to be fruitful and multiply. So you're going to want young animals on there so they can, they can, they can breed. Uh, <clears throat> so they're, they're going to be smaller from that standpoint uh, uh, also. Now, how about dinosaurs? Well, you don't have to push a 100-foot-long diplodocus onto this, onto this ark. You don't have to do it. The reason is because these dinosaurs hatch out of eggs. The largest egg that has been, dinosaur egg that has been found is about the size of a football. So you know that when that animal hatches out, it's not going to be all that big. It's not going to be even the size of a sheep. So those are the animals that are going to be directed to the, uh, to the ark. And it ends up being that... Uh, that the animals will fit on about, 20, about one fourth to one third of the space on the ark. And these are the most uh, conservative estimates. Some, some estimates are even less than that. So it shows, whatever the case is, that there's enough room on the ark to hold all these animals. The next question is, which is asked a lot, uh, how did Noah get all these animals? How does he get them all? Well, keep in mind, there's, probably, there's only one continent present on the, on the earth at this particular time. Uh, animals also don't have a fear of man at this particular time. They're, the fear of man between animals and man uh, occurs at the time when they get off the ark. And uh, <clears throat> also the climate was mild everywhere. So they didn't distribute as far, uh, and also food supplies across, because the the uh, temperatures and the earth was much more mild at the time, the uh, uh, food supplies were plentiful, and uh, we, you know, even the even the people who do not believe in this at all will accept that because they think the age of the dinosaurs, there was plentiful food all over the place, which there was. But it was just the time just prior to the to the flood where the when this was actually occurred. It's interesting that animals are pretty much uh, equally distributed at this particular time, and and uh, when we find these geographically isolated animals now, it's interesting that when you look into the fossil record, a lot of times you find these geographically distributed animals all in the same place uh, when you look at the fossil record which would indicate that they're more equally distributed. The other thing to keep in mind is migration was instituted by God. This instinct cannot be totally uh, uh, explained or understood uh, physiologically, but God gave the uh, animal pairs that were be to be spared on the ark uh, the instinct to migrate just prior to the time of the flood. Now, uh, we had another book that we got for the kids uh, on Noah's Ark, and it showed that there were huge numbers of animals that came to the Ark, and like there were, you know, there was 35 elephants waiting in line, wondering who was going to be picked to go on the Ark, you know, that type of thing. Again, it doesn't say that. The Bible actually says that the pair of animals was given, was, was directed to the ark. And uh, uh, so migration was instituted. This instinct is very strong and uh, the animals would have loaded 
it's so strong that uh, that the animals probably loaded themselves. Actually, Noah probably had nothing to do with it. Uh, I'll skip over this next slide, which is a slide of Silver Lake and the geese to give you an idea of migration. We uh, since the power plant uh, shut down, a lot of people don't understand this, but we used to have 35,000 geese on Silver Lake. They couldn't even hardly land out there in the 1980s if you were here at that particular time. And uh, they fly all the way from this area here between Lake Winnipeg and Lake uh, Manitoba. And uh, that's, where they, that's where they're in, this, in the summertime. And thousands and thousands of them would come in here. We don't appreciate that anymore now that uh, the power plant has closed down. But Genesis uh, 6.21 says, And take thou unto thee all food that is eaten. So the rest of the ark, in other words, is used for food. And thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. So <clears throat> how were all these animals uh, taken care of? Well, they can fit, be fit on 25 to 35% of the ark. The rest is for food. But God also, no doubt, gave the animals the ability to hibernate. There's also another word that's used, estivation. Those, those words, estivation is actually a summer sleep. So you not only, hibernation is thought to be during the time of, uh, the, during the winter time, Estivation is during the summertime, and a lot of the uh, rodents that live in the desert, for instance, will estivate, not hibernate. So these instincts are still present in these particular animals. And wh when does that occur? Well, it occurs when conditions are poor and there's a lack of food, and it still does occur in a lot of species today. You don't think of it. Uh, Syrian hamsters, for instance, if you ever had a hamster as a pet, that animal hibernates. And uh, it will estivate if it's in the desert or it'll hibernate when the weather gets cold. I can tell you that because uh, I've experienced it. We lost power and when I was at the University of Missouri. We lost power to a trailer one time. We had 700 hamsters in it and the temperature dropped uh, to probably 40 degrees and it was the quietest room you've ever seen. All of the animals were hibernating, all of them. There wasn't anybody moving. It was really interesting. So uh, you don't think of some of these animals, but they have the ability to actually hibernate. But when there's inactivity and the food and water requirements are minimal, and as I said, hibernation is present in, in most of the animals. So uh, God gives them the ability to do that. And uh, here's a black bear. You can see his nose here. He's so black you can hardly see him here. But he's, in, he's not a true hibernator, as they determine a true hibernator. He's a, he's a sleeper, but still, they are inactive. It's ideal for them to be inactive because they're in confined quarters. There's a lot less food and water required. And in this inactive condition, there's nothing to clean up. There's no bodily excretions at this particular time. Their GI tract uh, uh, pretty much closes down. So that explains a tremendous amount. And then when you ca figure out all these animals, and then, you know, some of the animals probably don't hibernate, there's food on board, and the uh, eight people can care for the rest. So <clears throat> it all, uh, all kind of makes sense here. And I'll end with this slide, but Noah was obedient. He, uh, uh, he did, this did Noah according to, the God, uh, to all that God commanded him, so did he. And it's actually stated four times that Noah did everything that God commanded him in this time period. He, uh, uh, he, he just followed God's, God's direction. I think I'm going to skip through, though, does the ark still exist? I want to just say a few things about this. There have been so many uh, expeditions to try to find this thing, and people have claimed that they have wood and claimed and, and some of it. You know, if you spend uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars to go over there, you're going to want to find something. But this is a picture of Mount Ararat. It is gigantic. This, this mountain is huge. 
17,000 feet. So when you figure uh, that you're, you're looking at a mountain that's 17,000 feet high, it's very difficult to go up there and start looking around and figuring out what's up there because there's no air, there's no oxygen. You know, you're, it's, it's difficult to do any work at all on mountains and especially ones that are 17,000 feet. So uh, it is very difficult. Uh, you can only go out, uh, do this, you can only even get to the mountain just a few months out of the year and uh, it's very difficult to find. Uh, it's very difficult to get into there. And now, look where Mount Ararat is. It's on the eastern edge of Turkey. Here's Iran right here. This is the border with Iran. Here's Armenia. This is our Azerbaijan. That's the area where the Boston bombers came from, by the way. This is Georgia. This area between the Caspian and Black Sea has always had people in it who have been fierce fighters. This goes back to the Assyrians and the Babylonians. They had all kinds of trouble with the people coming down from this area between the Black Sea and Caspian Sea in the Old Testament. You can read about it in the Old Testament. And it isn't any different, I don't think, today. This area is all Muslim right now. And, you know, you're, you're not going to want an expedition going in there with a politically unstable area we've got now. Nobody's going to go in there. You're not going to last very long. So, and you're not going to get the permits from Turkey to go in there anyway. So this is, is it up there? It could be. There's a lot of, you know, there's satellite photos of it and all kinds of stuff. And I, I've seen a, a lot of that stuff. On, but... Uh, but whether it's still up there or not, there's no definite proof that it, that it exists there. But it may very well be there.